Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Many times over the years on the Manifest Telecast, you have seen me stand in the city of Jerusalem, which we're doing again. This is our tour group. It's a beautiful day. We have seen absolutely nothing. Some people say, I don't want to go to Israel. I'm afraid of going. Are you afraid of going now? No. I'm telling you, it's amazing. And I want to encourage you around the world, if you ever have the opportunity to go, take that trip and do not let the enemy talk you out of it. Let's give the Lord a hand for being here, everybody. Oh, it's wonderful. It really is. All right. Okay, let's get started in the teaching of the Word of God from here in the city of Jerusalem. It's kind of odd for me to go to the book of Job and begin to teach from the book of Job in Jerusalem because Jerusalem, you usually do some kind of a prophetic word, prophetic teaching, ministry of Jesus, crucifixion, Passover, feast of Israel, something of that nature. But when I was in the room this morning, the Holy Spirit impressed me, go to the Mount of Olives and begin to teach the teaching from the book of Job. What I want to share with you on the program today is experiencing a divine reversal. There are a lot of people who are uh, struggling and going through difficulties. Sometimes it's self-invited trouble. Sometimes it's uninvited trouble. Sometimes it's circumstances that you have no control over. And you're just trying to figure out how to get out of the mess that you've got yourself into. Now, Job, I want to go to Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and the man was blameless, upright, and feared God, and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were, now look how wealthy he was, 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. Now, female animals were always more expensive back in that day because they could produce more animals. All right? 500 female donkeys, a very large household, and this man was the greatest of all of the people in the East. Now, that's saying something. This would be the Middle Eastern area. He was the wealthiest man of his day. If I can use an analogy here, he would be like the Donald Trump of, in America. Donald's a very, very wealthy businessman. So here Job is. He's the wealthiest guy. He's got it all. But watch what begins to happen. And I'm going to give you a nugget here about this. So Job uh, had ten children, and they each had a home of their own. And on this particular occasion, we read where Job would send and sanctify them, rise early in the morning, and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said... It may be that my sons of sin and cursed God in their hearts. This Job did continually, or he did it regularly. Now, I want, you, I want to emphasize something to you that's very important. When you, when you keep reading here in the book of Job, and you go up to verse 9, when God begins to say to Satan, have you considered Job? Satan says, you have put a hedge around him, and I cannot get in to attack anything that he has because of this hedge. I have studied this for many, many years. In fact, the book of Job, when we did our study Bible, and again, it won't be out for about three years, but we did the book of Job. One of the things I did was try to determine what the hedge was. In the natural, a hedge is thorn bushes. A hedge can be a wall. In this instance, Job did not see it. Satan and God did. If Job could not see it with his natural eye and Satan and God did, it means it was invisible to the natural eye, but visible to the spiritual eyes. It means, in my, in, actually in my opinion, the, angels of, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear God and deliver them. The Hebrew word encampeth means to circle around. So in other words, I'm of the opinion that angels of God were sent and assigned to totally, completely protect Job, to protect his property and also to protect his children. Now, what would put the hedge up? This is the next question, because if you have a hedge up, does it just come because you're righteous and good and God decides to protect you? Or is Job doing something to help keep the hedge up? My opinion, again, based on research, is that when it says in the Bible that Job sent and sacrificed a burnt offering on behalf of his children, for he feared they would curse God, that the blood sacrifice that Job is putting on the altar is actually forming and creating a hedge. Now, how do we know that? Because in Exodus 12, the blood of the left post, right post, and top post of a lamb 
on every Hebrew house protected them from the death angel. Uh, you can go through the Bible and discover that blood sacrifices many times would defeat Satan, would defeat the enemy, would defeat sin, would defeat the powers of darkness. So as, jo as Job is built an altar to God and he's offering sacrifices, he has put a hedge around everything he owns and the enemy cannot get in. Now we read here that Satan comes before God says the sons of God came to present themselves. This is in verse number six, before God and Satan came with them. Now, this is interesting because the word sons of God here is a Hebrew word that is found six times, sons of God, found six times, of, actually four main times in the, in, in the scripture. And it actually refers to a heavenly host or angels of some form. So there's a heavenly council meeting taking place in heaven and Satan is among them. Now you have to remember something that Satan is called the prince of the power of the air in the New Testament, Ephesians 2 and 2. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven in Luke 10. So Jesus was present with the Father when Satan was originally thrown out of heaven. But yet, in the book of Revelation 12, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren before God day and night. Satan, Satan, means an adversary, devil, diabolos, it, it, you, you have all these different names for Satan. He, the, the imagery of him in the book of Revelation is a dragon. And by the way, that Greek word dragon actually means a very large serpent with key, uh, keen eyes with the ability to see Satan, the devil, the dragon, the serpent. All these are names for, the, for our adversary. But notice here in Job, he somehow has access. I don't know where the access is. I don't know how limited it is. I don't know if God's throne would be like the Temple Mount and Satan is on the edge of the universe uh, speaking directly to God. But the point is, Revelation 12, he's the accuser of the brethren before God day and night. So God says to Satan, here's what we're going to do. You think Job is going to curse me if I take stuff from him. Is that right? Satan said, absolutely. So he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you the opportunity to do that. We're going to lift the hedge and let you test him. Now, let me tell you something about the hedge again. Please notice that Satan had no authority to come in Job's life at all until God gave him permission. Even under the old covenant, before the blood of Christ, before spiritual authority was released through the blood of Christ, God had, Satan had to have special permission to do certain things. So you know the story. Watch what happens. Now, this is important. You've got to catch this. So here comes the enemy. All of a sudden, the oxen and donkeys are taken. All of a sudden, lightning strikes and the sheep, all these sheep are killed. All of a sudden, the camels are, are stolen. Then the last thing that happens, the last thing that happens is there's a whirlwind that falls on the home where all the ten children of Job are kind of having a party and they all get killed. Notice this. It's important. The kids are not killed first. The kids are killed last. Notice it's the animals that are all taken. Can I tell you why the animals are taken? I believe this is a revelation from the Lord. The animals are taken because Satan knows as long as Job has a blood sacrifice, the hedge ain't going nowhere. Y'all got it? See, he knows as long as Job's got some... I felt something right there. Lord Jesus. As long as Job has a blood offering then there's such power in the blood in the eyes of God. But what Satan does, you see, you can put sheep on an altar. That's an animal you can put on the altar in the, in the, in the law, the, the lamb or the sheep. He takes the blood, and watch this now. Now, there's no blood to protect the kids because why was he making the sacrifice to protect his kids? He was making the sacrifice because his children may have cursed God. Now, we keep reading, and, and, and so... Huh, it says that when, all, when Job lost all of his wealth, he lost his kids. It says in the Bible, and all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. He didn't speak foolishly about God. So Satan didn't like that. He said, we're going to have to hit him again. Oh, this ain't working. <laughs> so he goes before God and says, let me tell you what a man will do. If a man's in health, he's going to be happy. You take a man's health from him and just put him in total misery, he's going to curse you. So God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you permission to do it. This is the funny thing about this story of Job. Satan thought he really knew Job, but God knew him a whole lot better than the devil did. Because, see, God knew what was really in his heart. He knew what was in Job's heart. There was integrity toward God in his heart, and he knew nothing going to move this man. I feel something right there glow. Now, going to give you a nugget. Ready? Going to give you a nugget here. So all of a sudden, Satan goes forth and smotes him with these terrible boils. I mean, later on in the book of Job, he's taking pottery and cutting the boil open and picking these worms out. It's like a, a, I did some research on this. There was a Middle Eastern type of disease that existed 
that actually produces worms underneath the skin. And this is what Job was, uh, listen, itching, total misery, total pain. In fact, it actually it got so bad that he said that his breath was bad. Nobody wanted to talk to him. His breath was bad. His body was corrupted. All of his friends had forsaken him. But the thing that's interesting is this, the second attack, and I wish I had time to really develop this, but the second attack, the first attack appears to have happened on what would later be known as, from the Torah, Feast of Trumpets. The second attack was the Day of Atonement. See, in other words, when Satan goes before the throne of God and goes to accuse Israel, it's always on the Day of Atonement. So these, this, this attack centered on feast times. So now Satan has come before on the Day of Atonement to accuse Job. Oh, that's good preaching right there. Now watch this. So all of a sudden Job is, is struck. Now I'm going to give you something that I did not know, all right? When his wife came, all translations of the Bible that I have read say, Job, why do you hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. That word curse is not the Hebrew word for curse. It's the Hebrew word for bless. This changes the whole scene right here. She said, why do you hold your integrity? Just, just bless God and die. And then that's where he says, you speak like a foolish woman. Now, that's in the Hebrew scripture. I'm not making that up. See, that just, that just, you got to get the Perry Stone Study Bible in three years to get these nuggets, okay? <laughs> Please don't call me and ask when it's going to be ready because it's going to be years from now. Woo, I took on something I didn't know what I was taking on when I did that. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, now it says that Job did not sin with his lips. But here's what happens in Job 2, okay? So all of a sudden, the three friends show up, and for seven days they say nothing to him because he's sitting in the ashes. He's got sores all over the place. He's lost his ten kids. He's lost all of his health and all of his wealth. Now we come to chapter 3. Now, now let me read chapter 3. Ready? So Job did not do what? What did Satan want Job to do? Curse, curse God. What did Job not do? Curse. He did not curse God. You're right. But watch what he does. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And then he goes on, and it starts saying in verse 8, May those curse it who curse the day. Now, Job's not cursing God. Now he's cursing himself. Wish I'd have never... Read it. It's sad. Wish I'd have never been born. Let darkness be. I don't even want to, want to know I even had a birthday. I wish I'd have died in the womb. So what he's now doing is he's saying things that, 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 that he's just as angry with what has taken place. But watch what happens. He comes, and I like the way the King James translation says it. He gets to the end of it, and he says, Oh, my, the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. And that which I was afraid of has come unto me. Now, I used to think he was saying there, because when I come through the Word of Faith movement years ago, the charismatic movement, they taught that Job must have made a bad confession or he was afraid of cursing God and that's why he lost everything. No, what he's saying there is, now here I was, word about cursing, cursing God, and here I am cursing myself. The thing, the, thing I, the thing I fear has come on me now, okay? I, I don't think he's so much saying the thing I feared of losing everything has come because there's nowhere in the previous text where he was afraid of losing everything. He didn't con there's no confession of that. But he was afraid of his words, of his mouth being so negative that it would have an impact. Now, there are people who live in the United States and even all over the world that have things happen. You have a tsunami that strikes. You have an earthquake that hits. You have a hurricane. I mean, I'll go to California and preach. I said, man, you guys out here with all these earthquakes, man, how do you handle that? And they look at me and say, you guys with all your hurricanes and tornadoes, how do you handle that? <laughs> I mean, in California, they're so used to the earthquakes. They really are. It kind of just goes right over there. The earth is shaking. Yeah, isn't that cool? Doesn't it feel funny? Okay, let's go shopping. <laughs> I mean, really, it's true. Now, you know, if a real big one hits, it's different. I said the difference between earthquakes in California and a tornado hurricane is we got time to get to the basement. <laughs> I mean, I've been in three, three little earthquakes, a 5-6 and a 5-4 in California, and I, the pool water was just doing this, you know, and I'm like, okay, Jesus, it's time to preach and get out. You know what I mean? Because you don't, you don't know it's going to strike. But a lot of people have natural disasters that happen. They have no control over. The house was destroyed. The business was destroyed. The floodwaters came in. And, and what's sad, it really breaks my heart when I see, especially anywhere in the world, where people don't have a way of covering it. They don't have insurance. They don't have a way of of somehow restoring. And I, and I sometimes I'll just sit and say, those poor folks, they're just like Job. They just feel, I know they got to feel like Job because they don't have anything. They're out there trying to find food. I'm thinking about some of my, I got some partners and friends. We got some folks on the trip here from like New Jersey and New York that went through, it was I think it was uh, Sandy, yes. And it just devastated. We have a couple here that left their apartment. They live way up, I think it's the 14th floor if they told me, if I remember correctly. No electricity still after all these weeks. 
And of course, when you see the manifest telecast, I'm sure by that time, everything will have gotten much better. But what do you do in that situation? All right, here's what you do. Job went weeks and months and every, he's trying to figure it out. He's got all these friends coming by who are trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden, you got to remember that when you're in the middle of this thing, if you'll just keep your mind on God, here's what God will do. Before he ever gives you a breakthrough, he'll send you a word. And here is the word to Job. Job chapter 28, surely there is a, a vein of silver in a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken out of the earth. Copper is melted from ore. Man puts an in, uh, it actually says he, King James, puts it into darkness and searches out everyone. Uh, and, he, and he goes on to talk about uh, in this real pretty, it's like a very poetic statement, how that there is a path that no vulture has seen. There's a path that no lion has ever been on. And I was reading this, and I really like the way the 1611 translation p talks about this. Surely there is a vein of silver and a place where gold is refined. Silver in the Bible is the metal that represents redemption. And when, when, what it, this, let me just give you the imagery I see here in the book of Job. The, the, the writer is saying this, okay, you don't find silver or gold laying on top of the earth. You have to dig down into the darkness of the earth in order to find the ore and the preciousness of gold and silver. And so what is happening here is they're saying, I believe they're saying to Job, Job, you don't know why you're going through this, but there's a vein of silver coming. There's a vein of redemption. You just keep on digging in the darkness, Job, because God's going to bring you out. Now we come toward the end of the book, and we don't know how long Job's trial was. Some suggest nine months. And again, we don't have the time to develop why some would say that. But watch what takes place. All of a sudden, all of Job's friends have been telling him everything that's wrong and why it's wrong. Then God himself shows up. And when God shows up in, in chapter 40 and 41, God starts talking about something called Behemoth in chapter 40. Then he talks about something called Leviathan in chapter 41. Now, this, is, this was the most confusing part of the whole book to me. Why does God show up instead of talking about Job's problems, how he's going to bring him out, how he's going to help him, what to do? He talks about two animals. A behemoth, which looks like a hippopotamus, and this Leviathan that some people say is an alligator, but it's not an alligator. You get to reading this thing, it's a supernatural being. Can I tell you why? The Bible says, he makes the deep to boil like a pot, verse 31. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment, verse 34. He beholds every high thing. He is king over the children of pride. Leviathan, if you know anything, is a picture of Satan because in the Bible that seven-headed dragon is a Leviathan in Revelation 12, and that is Satan himself. Why, why would God come down and tell Job about Leviathan and use this imagery of this mysterious creature and say, this is what you're dealing with, Job? Here's the reason why. Because Job had no idea that it was Satan that brought the trouble on. Do you know that? Whoever wrote the book of Job, if it was Moses or Job, they found out when the problem was over who did it. It was not God, it was Satan. Remember, Job said, Job's wife said, bless God and just die. See, they're thinking God did it. Job said, the Lord gave and the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was the devil that took it away from him. See, Job didn't know what was going on. So here's the thing. You ready for this? So the reason, I love it, that God has to show up to Job and has to reveal who did the attack, it was old Leviathan, is because there was a law in the Bible in the time of Moses that said this, if the thief be found, he must restore double. Oh, oh. double. All right, so all of a sudden, here we go. I'm going to try to wrap this up here. So all of a sudden, God comes down, reveals Leviathan, and then says to Job's friend, you didn't say what was right to Job. So here's what's going to happen. You bring seven rams and seven bulls and build an altar and put some blood on that altar. So the friends, so Job prays for his friends. He forgives them for the false things they have said. And then they come and bring a blood sacrifice up. Guess what happens when the blood sacrifice goes up? Here's what the Bible said. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends and blessed him with twice as much in the end as he had in the beginning. Wow. Think about this. So he, gets, he got double because God himself came and revealed the Viathon spirit, or we would say Satan was responsible for attacking Job. And God says, now let's see what we're going to do about it. And I'm going to give you five things how to get a divine reversal. And we're going to go through these so fast. Unless you can write in tongues and interpret it later, you're not even going to get it. All right. <laughs> Number one, know the source of the attack. Don't be blaming God for something God didn't do. 
Sometimes your source is a person the enemy is using. Sometimes it's just a circumstance. Number two, know the promises of God. Don't be ignorant of the Word. The devil will whip you sideways when you're ignorant of the Word. Know the promises. God's given you some specific things for your life and your family. Know them. Write them down. Put them on postcards. Stick them on the refrigerator. Stick them on the mirror. I'm serious. Put the Word that you look at it all the time. Number three, always be willing to forgive those that speak evil against you. Some, peop some people get stuck right there. God said to Job, he said, look, God turned to captivity when Job prayed for his friends who the whole time weren't saying the right thing to him. All right. Number four, in the book of Job, it says you shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. So you've got to begin to make decrees in the middle of the trial. God will bring us out. It is going to be okay. God is going to, God has to do this. I know I don't see it now. I know I don't feel it now. I know it don't look good right now. But somehow in some way, I'm about to get happy and jump over this rail. Woo. Yes, sir, it's true. Then. The fifth thing, the fifth thing is found in the New Testament. Hold fast the confession of your faith. Please notice, Job did not sin with his mouth. In other words, he understood the power of what he said. Now, this is something God's had to deal with me about because, man, I got messed up one time and I was complaining, and the Lord said, you're going to abort your breakthrough. He said, the enemy can take that and, and actually take what you're doing and abort your breakthrough and hinder you from receiving from me. So God's had to deal with me about this as well. Divine reversal can come your way. Now, the announcer comes, as always, to give you a special offer that's new that we'd like for you to get through the Manifest Telecast. And we're coming to you here with some new programs from the city of Jerusalem. And let's give the Lord a great big shout. <laughs> Available now is one of Perry Stone's most important prophetic resource offers. After researching the scriptures, sacred Jewish history, and historical documentation, Perry is releasing his new DVD, The Noah Code, The Day Believers Vanish, Decoding End Time Secrets Concealed in the Days of Noah. In this two-hour DVD, Perry lists ancient parallel signs leading to the return of Christ, many of which Christians are not aware of. He explores the three levels of time and reveals how judges in Sodom pass laws legalizing abominations similar to judges in America today. You will learn three specific things that must become full prior to Christ's return, and you will also discover four lesser-known incidents recording in sacred Jewish history that began occurring before God released His wrath on the world and how these same four strange signs are repeating themselves right now, including cosmic activity in the heavens. See how Methuselah and water were the pre-birth pain signs and what this means for us today. Perry will explain the law of escape for true believers and the amazing Genesis code revealing the precise order of the rapture and the tribulation. When the code is complete, the saints will disappear. This DVD is part of offer NC-104. When you order the Noah Code DVD, Perry will also include the audio CD message, Lessons from Old Time Saints on Surviving an Economic Crisis. Every person, including Christians, are concerned about their financial security. Perry explains how to survive and even thrive in tough economic times based upon a combination of biblical principles that when acted upon, move the favor of God toward you. After hearing and using these principles, many partners and friends connected to Perry's ministry have been blessed with jobs and favor they once thought impossible. Order this resource package by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323 or online at perrystone.org. You may also write to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, and request offer NC-104 for a donation of $25 or more. Shipping and handling are included. You will enjoy the impartation of amazing prophetic insight in this special offer. Thank you for your support that continues to help Manifest reach the nations of the world. We look forward to hearing from you today. God bless you today. Thank you for joining me on Manifest. I hope you take the time to get the offer because this is a brand new two-hour DVD teaching done in the studio. We use them. In fact, I want the producer to show the props of the ark we had, the ark that we had when we taped this uh, DVD. Uh, just great, great editing that was done. This is a great DVD. I want you to get it. Also, the CD 
which deals with how to, how to deal with tough financial times. It's a great offer this month. Hope you'll get it, and it'll be a blessing to you. Now, right behind me are props. And some of you over the years on the Manifest Telecast, you've seen me use what's a, a copy of the Babylonian Gate. Back here is a real famous guy. We call him Nebi. And uh, he's the uh, head of the, the gold, the chest and arms of silver, the hips of brass, legs of iron. Come over here on this side. i got to show you this. I just love this stuff. The kids, when we go preach revivals, this is what the parents tell me the kids love. You remember in the book of Daniel, he sees the, 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 the legs of iron and the two feet that are a mixture of iron and clay. Here they are right here, folks, right on the manifest set. Can you believe that? We brought them all the way in from Babylon. No, not really. We, we had them made. They're actually made of styrofoam. And they're painted. And we'll give you a little inside in, in information here. And come over here. Can we get a shot? I don't want to come out of the camp. But right here is that uh, in the book of Revelation 13 where he talks about the, 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 the beast that had the seven heads, the ten horns, the body of the leopard, the head of the lion, and the feet of, bear, of the bear. This is fabulous stuff. So what we're doing is in a few months we're going to uh, actually, as soon as we can, I'm going to be taping a really great series on the book of Daniel. So the reason I'm saying that is a lot of people will say, what are all these props for? And so when we do closings on the Manifest Telecast, we'll come into the studio here, and whatever prop happens to be up at that time that we're dealing with is what you see on the telecast. So anyway, wanted to let you know that, and uh, uh, just pray for us that we'll be able to effectively teach the Word of God in this day and time. A lot of you have asked me as well, because many of our partners know that we're working on a, a study Bible. I have 10 New Testament books left. I'm not putting a date on when this is going to be ready. I don't want to put myself under that pressure. But we're working hard to complete that. And uh, that's going to be something that I believe that, uh, you know, if the Lord tarries and, you know, you go to be with Him, it's something you can leave with the people on the planet to carry on the Word of God in your work. And if, uh, if Jesus don't tarry, we'll just go up and when He comes and comes back, come back and finish it in the millennium. How do you like that? But anyway, we want to just uh, express our appreciation to all of you. You know, partners, I can't wait to see you in the month of July. And, you know, we're going to be dedicating the OCI building. Uh, we've, we've got some great things planned. We've got some videos planned. We're going to bury the time capsule. It's going to be a great time at that uh, occasion. Look, just want to say how much I appreciate all of you and the people who pray for our ministry. Let me give you a couple places I'm coming to. Family Faith Church in Willis, Texas on Friday and Saturday, August the 16th and 17th. And then Sunday, three services, August the 18th, we're going to the Huntsville campus. Many of you have attended there. Come be with us. One night only, Friday night at Abba's house, Hickson, Tennessee, with Pastor Ron Phillips at his conference, the High Praise Worship Center, Pastor Robert Gay in Panama City, Florida. Never been there before, August the 25th. That'll be on a Sunday. Mark your calendar and then our great conference at Christ Temple in Huntington, West Virginia. We moved it from August to September. You can go on the website at parrotstone.org and you can get the information where all the places we're going to be coming to. Download the Stone Report, which is updated information, and we look forward to hearing from you. Now, as always, we try to take time to tell you the significance of being born again and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Every man is a sinner. We are sinners because of Adam's sin. It's handed down. It's, it's hereditary. And the only way to get the death penalty off of you is by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and taking on His sacrifice. He died in your place and receiving that sacrifice in your life and saying, Christ, through your blood, cleanse me, come into my heart, redeem me, I pray. I'm telling you, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost is a byproduct of a relationship with Jesus. I pray that you'll come to Him today and come to know Him. See you next week. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2013 Israel tour. The dates are November 25th through December 4th. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today, 1-888-321-3629.